Mr. Chairman, great to see you. Thanks for the time. Thanks for coming over. Is the Republican nomination fight over? Yes. Should Nikki Haley drop out? Yes. Why? Donald Trump will be the nominee for the Republican Party, and Donald Trump will be the next president elected in November of 24 and be sworn into office in January of 25. Look, it's important, as, as, as Tim Scott said when he was running for president, he said, the path to socialism runs through a divided Republican Party. It is time to unite, to get behind President Trump. You know, the folks who are cheering right now for this primary fight to continue are Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, and Joe Biden. So if Nikki Haley continues camp, her campaign, she is, if I hear you correctly, Mr. Chairman, aiding and abetting socialism. Well, there's just not a path for Nikki Haley to win the nomination. It's time to come around President Trump, line up behind him, and focus on the general election. This is going to be a tight race in the general election November of 24. We've got tight races for the president. There'll be tight races for the Senate. There'll be tight races for the U.S. House. And the stakes could not be higher. The contrast could not be more clear between you know, the philosophies, positions the Republicans are taking and President Trump will be taking and what Joe Biden has done to this country. The voters will have a very clear choice in November of 24. Speaker Mike Johnson said Monday that it's long past time for Republicans in Congress to endorse President Trump. Do you agree? Yeah, I do. I think it's time for all Republicans to get behind President Trump and focus on November. I mean, we are just eight months away. That includes from... Mitch McConnell and John Thune. Absolutely. Yeah, we should all get, we should all unite and get behind President Trump. He will be the nominee. He will be the nominee. He will win in November of 24 and be sworn into office in January 25. Last night on Truth Social, the former president said, anyone who donates to Nikki Haley will be out of the MAGA camp forever. Will the NRSC take a similar approach? Look, uh, last time I no checked... Take no donations from anyone who's helping Nikki Haley? No, well, look, um, as I approach the Senate race, which I'm solely focused on, <laughs> it's important to remember that winning elections is about addition, not subtraction. It's about multiplication, mm -hmm. not division. And so uh, we so need to... So you'll take money to, from people who continue to fund Nikki Haley? We want to make sure we unite and come together. That is the way you win elections. And that is why it's important that the sooner that we all unify and get behind President Trump and move forward towards a general election, the better off we'll be. Right. But if someone who is giving Nikki Haley a check gives the NRC, NRSC a check, you'll take it. Look, we'll, we'll deploy those dollars <laughs> to make sure Got it. we're electing Republicans in the United States Senate. Got it. Does the NRSC consider itself part of the MAGA camp? Look, we, what MAGA stands for is America First Agenda uh, is something that we support. We are absolutely behind this you know, lower taxes, American exceptionalism, ensuring that we are dominant in the world again. As voters take a look at what's happening in this country, they have incredible anxiety as they see what's happened certainly with inflation, uh, with the price of energy, as you look at the crime, you take a look at the wide open southern border. The southern border has now become the number one issue for voters. It wasn't just a number one issue in Iowa and New Hampshire. That is now, according to Harvard poll just this last weekend, the number one issue for the American people. In that regard, do you want there to be a deal on the Senate side on immigration policy as Senator Langford is pursuing? Mm. Well, what I want to see is the southern border back in control again. It is wildly out of control. Right. It's the Mexican cartels I that know. have command control. Senator Langford is working in pursuit of policy changes that Senator McConnell has said might be the best Republicans could get in the last 10 years. Yeah. Do you want that to succeed? Are you in favor of that? Do you want that brought to the floor and voted on? Yeah, well, first of all, none of us have seen the text of the bill. That, that's the first thing we've got to see. But what I've got to see is make sure that whatever is put together here is a means to the right end, and the end here is securing the southern border. This is one of our single greatest threats to our national security. I've made three trips down to the southern border, seen the chaos firsthand, and to think the Biden administration, as we speak, is going to be going after Governor Abbott, the great governor of Texas, who is trying to protect Texas, protect the country, by putting up you know, additional wire barriers there at Eagle Pass, which the American people have seen this flood of illegal migrants coming into our country, and to think the Department of Homeland Security under Joe Biden's watch and direction 
is seeking to remove some that Governor Abbott is doing to protect his people. I, I just, you have to laugh. The, the Department of Homeland Security should be called the Department of Homeland Insecurity. They're here to protect us, not to continue to, to, uh, to facilitate this, this uh, basically invasion on the southern border. Your colleagues on the Democratic side said yesterday that President Trump, if he becomes the nominee, will be an albatross for Senate candidates in 2024. Well, I, I laugh at that. You do. <laughs> the, the albatross around Senate candidates will be Joe Biden. Look at the numbers. We've not seen a president so unpopular you know, in a generation. His numbers are absolutely in the tank. Uh, go ask John Tester if he's looking forward to running with Joe Biden in Montana. I guarantee you this. Joe Biden will not be showing up in Montana to campaign for John Tester. Joe Biden will not be showing up in Ohio to campaign for Sheriff Brown. Joe Biden will not be showing up in West Virginia, which they've already surrendered on, to support whatever Democrats. Will they be Democrat in Pennsylvania made. for Bob Casey? Uh, I, I think the Casey campaign would be shuddering to think about what Biden might do in terms of you look at the rank and file blue collar voters who are absolutely fed up with what, the, what this administration has done. So, Gary Peters. Your colleague on the Democratic side told our Nicole Kelly in last week, quote, we're going to win. We have superior candidates. We continue to win on issues like reproductive freedom. So we're going to bring back all our incumbents and hold the states we currently have, including Michigan. Your reaction? Uh, to start with, what about West Virginia? He says he's going to hold all of our incumbents. Now, I realize uh, Joe Manchin has... He's not counting that as an incumbent anymore. Andrew, you know well, that. it's an incumbent state. And... Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what, uh, we've really worked okay, we'll hard. agree that's over. We, we've worked hard uh, at the NRSC under my leadership to uh, find candidates that can win not just primaries but general elections. Mm. That, that's what's key, key to, of course, winning in November is candidates that have a broader appeal. West Virginia is, is, uh, is proof point one where we recruited uh, Governor Jim Justice into that race. President Trump endorsed uh, Governor Justice in, uh, in mid-October. And by uh, mid-November, Manchin announced his retirement. It's peace through strength. We're seeing this, this continued, uh, really, momentum growing here across these key battleground states. Remember, in states like Montana and Ohio, every single statewide elected official is a Republican, except for John Tester in Montana and Sheriff Brown in Ohio. President Trump will carry both those states overwhelmingly and so uh, Gary Peters is a friend of mine. I respect Gary. Uh, I think he's dead wrong on that assessment. Talk to me about Kerry Lake in Arizona. When we spoke in July, you said you'd had good and robust conversations with her about focusing on the future. Yesterday, the chair of the state party in Arizona resigned because of a story based on recordings that Kerry Lake made of their conversations 10 months ago. She alleges the state party chair is unethical, is Carrie Lake a problem for you in Arizona? Look, Carrie Lake is an outstanding candidate. In fact, I think she is one of the most talented candidates we have across the battlefield in the Senate races in this country. She's very articulate, she's very passionate, and look, the, the latest polls, in fact, a PPP poll that's mm -hmm. a Democrat poll that came out of Arizona in the last two weeks show Carrie Lake beating Gallego head to head. So Carrie not only is a strong candidate, Carrie Lake is going to be the next senator from the state of Arizona. Is she on the ethical high ground here in this dispute with the party chair? Look, I mean, Carrie, Carrie Lake, and I, the first I knew about this was I saw the social media report yesterday. I, I haven't, in fact, even listened to the recording, but I saw it out there in the social media buzz. Um, look, she is a solid, strong candidate. She pushed back, according to the reports I've read, she pushed back on any attempts here to try to you know, bribe her out of the race. She pushed back against that. To me, that's a, that's a high standard of integrity. She's doing the right thing, and uh, we're glad to see Carrie Lake in that race. And I think Carrie Lake is going to be the next senator from Arizona. When we talked in July, you said former President Trump was helping you mm -hmm. in this larger pursuit of candidates who can not only win primaries, but win the general. Has he done that in Ohio with Bernie Moreno? So uh, we've stayed out of Ohio. I know you have. But to tell you, I mean, uh, Bernie is a, is a strong candidate. To be Frank LaRose is a strong candidate. Matt Dolan's a strong candidate. We think we have three good candidates in Ohio. But it's not lost on any of us that when President Trump steps in and endorses a candidate, uh, it is a huge boost to their candidacy. We saw that with J.D. Vance mm -hmm. in 2022. You know, J.D. was, uh, was not leading nope. in, in that primary, in nope. those primaries at that moment. 
and it was President Trump's endorsement of J.D. Vance that propelled him to, to the primary win and the general election. Are you foreshadowing a similar impact in Ohio this I, time? I think so. You know, we, we, there's been some polls that's come out that, that show that uh, Marino is starting to show some, some leads in that primary. It's been that rocket fuel is real. Oh, it's, it's very real. It's very real. I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a big win for Bernie Marino to get that endorsement uh, from President Trump. When do you expect Matt Rosendale to announce his candidacy for the Senate? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I've you known, know it's coming. I've, know, I've known Matt a long time. I know you have, but you know and, it's coming. Uh, and he, he's a good friend. Um, yeah, he, 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 may, he may indeed announce. Uh, he's been talking about an announcement for, uh, for several months. He's been talking about this since last summer. But uh, I think at some point he probably will get in that race. I hope he stays in his House seat and continues to build seniority for the great state of Montana. But, uh, you know, it seems like he may be getting in that race, and we'll see what happens. Will you endorse in that race? I already have, yeah. I've endorsed with Tim, Tim, I'm Tim sorry. Sheehy. Yeah, yeah I've endorsed in that race. So when you think about Matt Rosendale, do you think it's a mistake? Well, look, I think, you know, primaries generally are not always helpful. And so I think it'd be better if Matt Rosen were to stay in the, in the House and build seniority. But uh, we'll see what he does. Uh, that, that'll be his news to break if he indeed decides to get in that race. But he'll lose. I tell you, Tim Shee is an outstanding candidate. You look at, uh, again, you look across the battlefield across the United States. You have, um, you know, a 37-year-old man who served 100 combat missions as a Navy SEAL. He literally has Iranian shrapnel in his body. His wife, also a graduate of the Naval Academy, as Tim is, uh, served in the Marine Corps. They both served in Afghanistan. In fact, they were married by a judge in Kalispell, Montana, because Montana is the only state that allows a double proxy wedding. It's a great story. Uh, he's also a great businessman. He's going to be a very strong candidate. Montana has the second highest per capita veteran population mm -hmm. in America. A veteran like Tim Shee will be very appealing, not only to Republican primary voters, but very appealing in the general. Back to Arizona real quickly. When we talked in July, we were both uncertain, and we still are, about Senator Cinema. Yeah. What difference does that make? You know, um, in the polling that we have done, uh, both you know, our private polling in and, and, and the public polling, you see that uh, those, it, those voters that are supporting Kirsten Cinema are, are breaking about evenly between you know, a Gallego candidacy and a Lake candidacy. In fact, that PPP poll mm -hmm. showed, uh, showed Lake ahead of Gallego in a head-to-head two-person race. And so I, I think you know, it's, it's becoming increasingly likely that Kirsten Cinema uh, does not run. She's got to finally get some 40,000 mm -hmm. plus signatures mm -hmm. to get on the ballot as an independent and when you when you have to go through the signature process you have to get extra than mm -hmm. just the minimum probably 50 percent more so sure. probably 50 60 thousand signatures that's a big undertaking she has till april 8th to do that so we're not seeing any signs of doing that uh, you know i, I work with you're Center, assuming she's not running well it's looking increasingly likely mm -hing. she's not but uh, but so e it's like either, either either way either way there's a path and you like the way that lays yeah i do very much so diagram michigan for me look i think michigan michigan is the under discussed race right now uh, in this cycle. Remember, it's an open seat. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator Stabenow announced a retirement. Yep. We've got a really strong candidate that we're behind in Mike Rogers. Of course, Mike was a former congressman. Mm -hmm. He was chairman of the Intelligence Committee in the U.S. House, and he knows what it takes to win in you know, uh, swing kind of districts, which he represented in Michigan. He's an outstanding candidate, and, and Biden's in trouble. You know, th I think the underreported story in Michigan politically speaking, is the troubles Joe Biden's having in Michigan. Look, those auto workers, despite the endorsement of the UAW. Very brass, loud yesterday, very loud yeah, yesterday. But, but this is where the brass, the leadership of these unions is out of touch with their rank and file. You ask these rank and file union members, what do you think about Joe Biden's mandate on EV vehicles? Look, most of us have no problem with EVs, but to have the government tell us we have to drive one is a completely different discussion and being pushed back by those, you know, the auto workers there in, in Michigan. Does the discontent over the Israel-Hamas conflict in Michigan also so I think there's an, there's work an under, to your advantage? Under underlying current in Michigan certainly would be where you've got uh, Jewish voters upset with President Biden and you've got Muslim voters, those who are pro-Palestinians upset with President Biden. Those cross currents are creating a real problem for Joe Biden in Michigan. But I think the biggest problem there is, is Michiganders are looking at what's happening, the out-of-control border, the inflation, price of energy, and this you know, anti-energy policies coming out of this administration. That resonates loud and clear with rank-and-file voters like 
you know, auto workers in Michigan. That's why I think that uh, Mike Rogers is going to be the nominee in the primary, and I think he'll be the next senator from Michigan. Wisconsin. So we'll have news to break there probably uh, this coming month. Go ahead. In February. Well, not, not yet, I, I, but it looks like uh, uh, Eric Hovde mm -hmm. is, uh, is looking at that race very seriously. Uh, he'll be, That's he, the news you intend to break. Well, yeah. Well, well, well he, I'll let him break the news, uh, Major, on that. But Eric Hovde's looking strongly at getting in that race probably. And what does February. that mean? Well, I'll tell you what, it puts Wisconsin in play. Um, it's a state that you, you, you step back and look at, at uh, what happened in the 22 election. Every state that Trump won, we won the Senate race in 22. Every state that Trump lost, we lost the Senate race in 22, except for Michigan, and Ron Johnson won his re-election. Wisconsin. In, in, excuse me, except in Wisconsin when Ron Johnson um, won, mm -hmm. won his re-election there. So, uh, you know, Eric ran against Tommy Thompson years ago in that yep. primary. It was very competitive. He's been focused on his private sector career and building jobs and building businesses, and uh, I think he'll be a great candidate if he gets in. Let me run something else that Gary Peters told or Nicole Killian last week, direct quote. We have real opportunities in both Florida and Texas to pick up two seats. Do you want them to spend a lot of money in Florida and Texas? <laughs> Bring it on. They will, and it's going to be money wasted. Look, we've got two great candidates there in uh, Ted Cruz in Texas and Rick Scott in Florida. Uh, they're both taking the races very seriously. As you always say in politics, run like you're five, ten points mm -hmm. behind, and they're both doing that even though they're ahead. Uh, they're both great candidates. I'll tell you, I mean, again, I respect Gary Peters, but uh, that's a statement that almost deserves a chuckle. Go ahead and spend $100 million in Florida. Knock you, yourselves out. You know, you saw them do that against Lindsey Graham in South Carolina. They spent a ton of money to beat Lindsey Graham. It wasn't even close. Mitch McConnell, uh, too. And, and certainly Kentucky is the same thing. So I think, you know, if they and want to... both Florida if they, if and if Texas are much if, more if, expensive if, than if, South if, Carolina. If, if, if they're putting a bunch of money into Texas and... Uh, and into Florida. Uh, that, that's their choice, but uh, I'll tell you, uh, I would not be betting against Ted Cruz in Texas and Rick Scott in Florida. As you think about it, Mr. Chairman, what's the upside number for this cycle for I, you? I want to see a majority. You know, we're halfway through this cycle. In fact, we're past do, the halfway point. What's the upside points. number? What's, yeah. what's your most aspirational number? I want, to, I want to get a majority. That's 51. Mm -hmm. What's possible beyond 51? I'll let you decide that. <laughs> but, I, you know, we... We've got the best map in 10 years. Uh, we've got some of the, you know, the best So you can't blow it. And, uh, well, we're not going to blow it. We're going to get the majority back. You are. But we've, we've, got a, we've got a great map. Uh, you think about our 11 incumbents that we're defending versus the Democrats mm -hmm. defending 23. So right away, you start with a two to one advantage just in terms of seats that are in play. But importantly, those 11 Republican incumbent seats are in, in you know, Republican states, starting with Texas and Florida, and then you get you know, very red states like uh, you know, Utah and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Wyoming and so forth. So. so this will be the first national election since Dobbs. Mm -hmm. Abortion has played on the Democratic side of the issue in race after race after race, even in the Virginia legislative races here in 2023, in referenda across the country, in other places. It seems to be something that the party on your side is having a hard time discussing and have a hard time dealing with. Mm -hmm. There'll be initiatives in several of the states in which you're going to be running Senate races. How problematic is this issue, the framing and the motivational factor it's clearly having, not only on Democrats, but on lightly attached Republicans and yeah. urban voters? Well, look, first of all, the Democrats can't run on the most important issues the American people have identified in polling, which is the out of control border. Inflation, inflation and immigration, the two eyes. Absolutely. The, the flood of fentanyl coming into our country, the crime resulting across our cities yeah, but and communities. That was, the, that was the playbook in 2022. But I'm saying that they can't run on those issues. So what they have to do is they have to identify an issue to, to move away from the core issues that most American people care about the most, and that's abortion, is they're trying to make that the issue in the 24 election. Look, here's where we stand on it. We'll be very clear on this. We need our candidates to look right at the camera and lay out this position. And it's, number one, it's a lie to suggest that Republicans want to see a federal ban on all abortions. That's a lie. That's absolutely untrue. Second, we believe we should have exceptions for rape, incest, and the life of the mother. Three, we believe there should be reasonable limits set 
on late-term abortions. That's the Republican position. Contrast that to the Democrat position. Every one of these incumbents that are up for re-election have not, have not voted to put any limits, any limits on abortions, taxpayer-funded abortions, mm -hmm. up until the moment of birth. That's chilling. Mm -hmm. When the American people see the contrast in a reasonable position I just stated and the extreme position of the Democrats, that becomes a 70-30 issue as we poll test that and work with focus groups. But you know, Mr. Chairman, at the debate in Ohio, all three Republican candidates endorsed a federal ban. Carrie Lake has endorsed a law in Arizona that is not what you described. In Wisconsin, there's a conversation about a law there that is much more aggressive than the position you just described. Those are realities. Those are going to come up in the conversation. Yeah, Those course. are positions they've taken. Yeah, but look, look there is... The Senate is not going to ever pass a federal ban on all abortions. It will not happen. The American people want to see, want to see reasonable limits placed right. on late-term abortions. They don't want to see, when exposed, the radical position the Democrats have taken. Because the question you ask is, ask any Democrat running, where would you draw any line on the issue of taxpayer-funded abortions? You'll never get an answer out of them. You never will. We've tried. Mm. You've tried. They mm -hmm. never will give you an answer. Because, and they've already been on record in voting for allowing abortions, taxpayer funded abortions, mm. up until the very moment of birth. That is chilling. That's out of step where most are. So the Democrats you, have been what, on the airwaves telling what you. What you need to do and what your candidates need to do is change the focus, is shift it off where they are and shift it to the Democrats. Just, we, but that's what Glenn Young can try to do in the Assembly and State Senate yeah. races, and it didn't work. You can't back away from this issue. Mm -hmm. Abortion, our candidates need to clearly articulate where they stand for the reasonable limits with exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother. Mr. Chairman, always a pleasure. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Major.